Brian's struggles are no surprise. A baseball hitter facing a pitcher standing 60 feet 6 inches away and throwing 95 miles per hour has only 395 milliseconds to react to the ball. Jenny, standing only 43 feet away and throwing 70 miles per hour, allows the hitter only 350 milliseconds to react. So a softball batter has less time to react. And that's not the only disadvantage. We did a lot of studies on what makes it difficult to hit a pitcher. And one of the things that makes it difficult is the visual. Baseball hitters typically are used to seeing a pitch come from a certain area. So unless they've seen a lot of pitchers that come from down under, they're going to have a difficult time with that. Our Vicon House of Moves motion capture technology allows us to break down the pitching motion of Jenny Finch in order to illustrate exactly why it's more difficult to hit a softball than a baseball. This is not a computer simulation. This is Jenny's actual pitch. The softball pitch may look casual, but it packs a punch. Jenny's shoulder is a fulcrum, and her arm a three-foot long lever. With massive rotational inertia, she rockets the ball over 70 miles per hour. The baseball's falling high to low path makes a last instant swing adjustment easier. Because of gravity, a batter can quickly drop his hands and hit a descending ball. For softball, the low to high trajectory makes adjustment difficult. It's much harder for a batter to raise his hands than it is to drop them, making a rising softball pitch a unique challenge. What did you think? It's just different. A lot different. It was tough. It was tough. What's the biggest single difference? I think it's just the angle. And, you know, Jenny was throwing some balls that rise. So the myth that hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in all of sports? Shattered. Oh. Coming up. This NHL goalie suffered one of the most horrifying injuries in the history of sports. For the first time ever, we'll show you how he survived. Sports Science returns in a heartbeat. Warning. The following program contains graphic images of intense sports injuries that some might find disturbing. Viewer discretion advised. It's one of the most notorious moments in sports history. In the middle of a game, hockey goalie Clint Malarchuk takes a skate right across the throat. Malarchuk began to lose blood rapidly. But how bad was the injury? How close did he come to dying? Brace yourself. This is not a Hollywood special effect. It's a lot worse. March 22nd, 1989. The Buffalo Sabres host the St. Louis Blues. Tending goal for the Sabres is Clint Malarchuk. Steve Tuttle of the Blues and Uwe Krupp of the Sabres collide in the goal. The result? Every hockey player's worst nightmare. In the collision, Tuttle's skate accidentally makes contact with goalie Malarchuk's neck. Oh, wow! Uh, watch Malarchuk. That's the story right now with my God, what happened? Oh, please take the camera off and don't even bring it over there. Malarchuk's jugular vein has been cut. Within 40 seconds of the collision, Clint is rushed away from the scene of this horrifying accident. So with his jugular vein cut, how did he survive? Here to tell the tale is the man himself, Clint Malarchuk.
When I saw the first squirts of blood, I, I knew that it was a, a main artery or a main vein, a jugular vein, because the blood squirted four or five feet in front of me. To better understand the dynamics of this frightening accident, here's an inside look. When Steve Tuttle's skate blade met Clint's unprotected neck, it cut through the skin and into the best known vein in the human body, the jugular. The jugular's job is to drain blood from the head, brain, face, and neck back to the heart. And any laceration can quickly cause significant blood loss. I remember the referee leaning his hands on his knees right in front of me. His eyes were big saucers, and he, he looked like he was as scared as I was, probably. I remember him saying, get a stretcher, he's going to bleed to death. Not surprisingly, human flesh is no match for the carbon steel blade of a hockey skate. Less than four millimeters wide, the business part of the skate is actually concave, in the shape of a U. So it's not really like a knife so much as it's like a twin blade razor. As the blade makes contact, it slices through all three layers of skin, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous. Tendons and muscles provide little resistance as the speed and the weight of the skater force the blade deeper, quickly reaching the jugular. So how close did Clint Malarcha come to dying? To find out, our scientists create a simple experiment. This plastic container is filled with 10 pints of simulated blood, which is, amazingly, all the blood we have in our bodies. The container is pressurized at 18 PSI, which represents the average amount of blood pressure in our bodies. The idea is to puncture it, to see just how quickly we can lose a critical and fatal amount of blood. Here we go. After you lose 15% of your blood volume, your heart will start to pound in your chest in order to keep up and keep your blood pressure up. After you've lost 30% of your blood volume, your heart will no longer be able to keep up and your blood pressure will start to drop. When you hit 40% of your blood volume, then you're really in trouble and you may start to feel faint. Not long after that, you'll black out. More than 40% of your blood volume and the body will not be able to survive. The time it takes for your body to bleed out, with a wound like Clint's, two minutes and 16 seconds. That's a bleed out. You'd be dead. So how did he survive? With 10% of his blood already spilled on the ice, a hero emerged. Although it must have seemed like a lifetime, Buffalo's trainer Jim Pizzatelli was at Clint's side in a flash, only 14 seconds after the accident. And Pizzatelli, a former Vietnam Army medic, immediately reached into Malarchek's neck and pinched off the bleeding. The most important thing that you can do in the case of a lacerated artery or a vein is to put pressure on that vein. In this case, the trainer really saved Clint's life by putting pressure on that vein. Clint ended up getting over 300 stitches in an emergency operation, walked out of the hospital in two days, and back onto the ice in time for the playoffs. But his near-death experience haunted him for months. I'd have nightmares of that skate coming up. I'd wake up and just sit straight up in bed, boom, and it's like, just like in the movies, you know, you're like breathing hard and like, wow, gee, oh, uh, just, okay, it's a dream, it didn't happen again, you know, the, all these things. And chances are, it won't happen again, at least not to a goalie. After the Malarchuk incident, the National Hockey League passed a rule requiring all goalies to wear neck protectors. Next on Sports Science, it's one of the oldest myths in all of sports. No sex the night before the big game. But is it true? Does sex really affect athletic performance? Heavyweight champ Chris Bird and his wife get busy in the name of science. Once and for all, let's, let's put this myth let's to bed. Let's do it. Let's do it.
It's a myth as old as competition. Sex can throw off your game. There is this myth that you have to ab abstain from sex before a fight. No sex. <laughs> I truly don't believe in it. The night before the game is going to affect how I play on Sunday. I think that myth, that is created, that myth, to keep fighters in line. I guess it's in my mind already, so I, I'll just not take the risk. So we want to know, does having sex before you compete really decrease your performance? Or is it just a coach?